Uh, when I was a, a late elementary school, maybe early, min- uh, early middle school boy, I wore a hat to church. Uh, now, it was Sunday evening church, so it was a little bit more casual atmosphere. atmosphere. Those of you that uh, have maybe been to a Sunday evening church service before, uh, and uh, I frequently wore uh, shorts and tennis shoes. I, I didn't wear slacks typically on, on, a, on a Sunday evening, and uh, a lot of people my age did as well. And so on this one particular Sunday evening, I wore a hat to church, and uh, I was particularly proud of the hat because I just, uh, I just bought it. Where the money came from, probably my parents. But uh, I just bought this hat, and so I wanted to uh, wear it to church to show it to my friends. And so I did, and um, I happened to be with a friend when I bought the hat, who also went to the church. And so he ran up to me during uh, sort of the classic greeting time that we had. And he said, wow, cool, you wore your hat to church. My parents wouldn't let me wear my hat to church. Uh, And my parents, overhearing this, in particular my dad being on the staff, asked me to take my hat off for uh, the rest of the service. And so I was was a little bit embarrassed by this because uh, as the rule follower that I was, I felt like I'd broken some rule that I hadn't been told before. And I didn't really understand why I had to take... uh, my hat off in the church. And uh, some would say that it's because of the scripture that we'll read today. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but I would say it was more about sort of the decorum of the time. And even today, I don't see anybody here with ball caps on in the building. Uh, because there's, there's a type of uh, decorum that we typically think about when it comes to church and worship. There was another moment uh, when I went to uh, worship in another place, and uh, we went, I was in a church, I was serving in a church at seminary, and our church partnered with several other churches on Good Friday. And so maybe you've heard of the seven last sayings of Jesus. Uh, they're, uh, the, the last seven things that Jesus said when he was on the cross. So they're, uh, they're in all four of the Gospels. And sometimes churches will have services around these seven last sayings. And they'll preach on them, talk about uh, Jesus' last moments there hanging on the cross and what he said and, and why that matters. Uh, well, we had joined together with several other churches churches, and there were, I think, three or four preachers who were rotating through each of these sayings. And most of the other churches were predominantly black churches. And so our church was sort of in the racial minority, so we uh, we sort of felt like we stuck out like sore thumbs anyway, uh, being there with the predominantly black churches. It was a great opportunity to join together in worship, but we wanted to make sure that we followed the decorum of this sister church that we were visiting. And so uh, during the offering time, rather than passing a plate down the aisle and having uh, the deacons or ushers or whoever walk down the aisle, uh, each aisle, uh, each row stood up one at a time and walked to the front of the church and gave their offering into the container and then walked back orderly a different way back to their row. Well, this was all going great uh, until a woman in our church uh, seemed to completely disregard the order that was happening. And I, nobody said anything, but I felt so embarrassed for our church uh, because uh, we looked different than most people there already. And now we looked a little more foolish than most people there because of how this woman was disregarding the decorum of the church. Uh, She didn't break anything. Nobody got mad at her. But it was fairly obvious when she didn't do what everybody else was doing. And so these types of situations, maybe you've been in one before, cause us to wonder, what does decorum matter? What does uh, maybe what we wear matter? How we present ourselves? Do these things matter in church? Why or why not? And that's the question we're going to look at as we dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you would turn with me uh, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we continue this trek through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing this letter uh, to a church that he has planted in Corinth, which is uh, a major city at the time, popular trading hub. And so these people are trying to sort out how to live their faith in this culture that is not necessarily friendly or even oriented towards Christianity and faith in Jesus. So Paul's going to talk with the Corinthians about one particular issue, and we're going to relate that to how we think about church and how we think about worship. So look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. We'll just begin with those first two verses. 
I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I passed them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, so there's already been a lot that's happened in these first two verses. The first thing I want to point out to you is this word traditions in verse 2. Usually when we see this, uh, this word in the New Testament, oftentimes it's actually in a, in a pretty negative light. Uh, so Jesus uses this word when he's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he says things like, you elevate your traditions over the love of God. You elevate your traditions over what God would have you do. You elevate human traditions over what God says in the scriptures. And multiple times, Jesus gets on to the Pharisees for doing this type of thing. Even Paul himself, in some of his writings, it talks about himself, how he, how he used to be a Pharisee, and how he kept all of the traditions. He was able to do all of the stuff that he needed to do. And he talks negatively about those traditions in comparison to uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, ultimately, that's what we are called to receive, not merely to follow a bunch of rules and be a bunch of legalists. And when Paul here, he uses this word positively, whenever he uses the word traditions positively, he's most often pointing to that teaching, what Jesus Christ has done. In fact, in other verses where this Greek word is used, it's sometimes translated teachings. And Paul is talking about how uh, the people have held on to what Paul taught them about the grace of Jesus and about the love of Christ and how they are called to that. And so it's important, first of all, that we have that in mind as we think about the traditions Paul is talking about. And then he, he goes on in uh, verse 3, to give these three uh, sort of metaphors, the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And I think this last phrase, the head of Christ is God, is the interpretive key for understanding those other two comparisons. So we see that word head, and we, we maybe see uh, the word leader or uh, uh, the person that's in charge uh, or something of that nature. Uh, but Christ, when he talks about his relationship with God in the Gospels, seems to display a more intimate relationship than merely a leader that he follows. And that Jesus in the Gospel of John says, I and the Father are one. In the Gospel of Matthew, he says, no one knows the Father except the Son. And Jesus is, of course, the Son. And, and that's ultimately what gets him crucified because he makes this comparison of himself to the Father, how intimately acquainted he is with the Father. The Pharisees get sick of that sort of talk, call him a blasphemer, and ask Pilate to crucify him. Just this week, the, the staff was looking at the Gospel of John, and in John chapter 19, uh, Pilate puts a, 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 what do you call this? a plaque, uh, a plaque above the head of Jesus that says, the King of the Jews. And the Pharisees come to Pilate and they say, no, 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 please write, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. Because the Pharisees didn't want Jesus to be seen as the king of the Jews. They didn't want Jesus to be seen as having this intimate relationship with the father that he so often talks about. And again, in John chapter 14, Philip comes to Jesus and he says, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. We just want to see the Father. Quit, quit speaking so cryptically like you always do and show us God. And Jesus, in responding to Philip, says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone has seen Jesus has seen the character of God himself, understands who God is, understands what God intends for each of us. Jesus says, if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. So when, when we think of the head of Christ is God, that's what we're meant to call to mind. This intimate relationship between father and son. And the same goes for these other two relationships that are listed. Not some type of uh, dominance of one over the other. Uh, the father certainly didn't dominate over Christ and these other partners listed are not meant to dominate over each other either. Uh, let's continue on in the passage, verses 4 through 6. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. 
But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. And this is sort of where we start to read this text and we think, this is really weird. I don't understand a bit about what's going on here. Why does it matter uh, what women's hair is like? Why does it matter if their, if their hair is covered, if their, if their hair is shaved? And what is going on here, Paul? And we're going to get into some possible explanations for this. But I think the most important thing that I want you to see is this word dishonor. Both for the male and for the female, uh, Paul points to things that, that show dishonor. And, and for his day, this sort of decorum is a way that you might show dishonor. Maybe by not having your head covered, or if you're a male, by having your head covered. Now, we don't, we don't hold on to this today. And we'll, again, get into that in a little bit. But Paul is pointing to the importance of not showing dishonor. That's the most important thing that I want you to see. Now, let's read it a little further, verses 7 through 10. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Again, this is where it gets kind of weird. Because of the angels. What are you talking about, Paul? Uh, Where else does the New Testament talk about angels and how we ought to worship because of the angels? Let's, Let's just be honest and say this is kind of weird stuff, right? And it's hard to know exactly what Paul is saying. You, you go read the most serious biblical scholars, and they sort of give you their best guess answer. Uh, David Garland, in commenting on this passage, uh, talks about how in pagan religion at the time, men might have worn a turban on their head, and this might have been common for them. And so Paul wants these men to be differentiated uh, from those men who practice pagan religion. And for the women... Paul says uh, he wants them to have their heads covered uh, because there might have been some type of implication for the women whose heads were uncovered. And and people have talked about prostitution and and other types of things like that. We'll get into some other explanations as we move down the passage. Uh, But Garland also quotes an ancient novel that was written about 100 years after this passage might have been written. And in that ancient novel, which is a secular novel that was uh, written by a person at the time, uh, this is a quote from the main character. It it has always been the prime concern of my life, the prime concern of my life, to observe in public the heads and tresses of beautiful women, and then to conjure up the image at home for leisurely enjoyment. So this ancient man is ogling women's heads. It's this sort of strange thing that this man is doing. There's something about uh, women's heads and their their beliefs about that 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 causes it to be a stumbling block for men. Obviously, we don't believe this today. And again, we'll get into why this might be the case. Uh, But Garland uses this as evidence uh, to say that this is a cultural thing at the time. Uh, This is how people understand something in a way that we don't understand it any longer. And because of that cultural understanding, Paul says, listen, women should cover their heads as a mode of modesty. Uh, Let's continue on verses 11 through 15, 16. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. So again, the exact details of why this is necessary are a little bit difficult to parse out. But Paul wants to emphasize uh, that according to their understanding of the nature of things, uh, women ought to have their heads covered and men ought to have their heads uncovered. And this is for modesty in worship. 
As I was uh, researching this passage, actually some time ago, before even uh, preparing for this sermon, somebody uh, told me about a podcast in which uh, a biblical scholar uh, is cited. And that biblical scholar is Troy Martin. And he's a, an academic, a professor of the New Testament. And he wrote an article for the Journal of Biblical Literature, this respected journal about the Bible. And in this article, he digs into this passage, specifically verses 14 and 15. And he talks about medical terminology of the day. Maybe you're familiar with uh, the name Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, This is often an oath that's taken by doctors even today as they go into medicine because Hippocrates was uh, sort of the founder of medicine. Maybe you're familiar with Aristotle, who is considered a great philosopher a couple of hundred years before Jesus lived. Both of these men have different texts in which they discuss reproduction and talk about women's hair and the role of women's hair in reproduction. That's weird. But that's the belief that they had. This was the scientific belief that they held on to, right? And so Troy Martin, in talking about that, says Paul likely has that in view. And so Troy Martin says when Paul talks about the nature of things, this is the word where we, the root for physiology, physis, physiology, comes from this word that's translated nature of things. And, and Paul talks about this in the same way that Hippocrates and Aristotle seem to be talking about it. And so if they believed that women's hair was, had something to do with reproductive fitness, we would understand why it might need to be covered, why Paul might call for this. Again, it's, it's a bit scientifically ridiculous. We understand that that's not the case at all. But if that was the scientific starting point for them, then we can understand why Paul is calling for modesty in this way. And if we read this this quote from this main character in this novel and how he is looking at women's heads in a seemingly lustfully way, we can understand why Paul is saying women ought to have their heads covered. In a very specific cultural way, Paul is calling for modesty in the church. And it's not merely modesty when you're out and about, modesty when you're, when you're talking to friends, though we can assume that Paul might want that as well. Paul is talking about modesty in worship. He's saying when either the men or the women pray or prophesy, they should have a sense of modesty about them. And there's something even having to do with the angels. Again, that's difficult to parse apart because we don't don't have a great understanding of what that means from Scripture. But Paul believes that there is something supernatural happening in worship, such that spiritual beings are present with the Corinthians while they worship. Some people have said maybe he has something like Exodus 6 in mind. You might recall we covered that passage earlier this year. Exodus 6 is where these angelic or spiritual beings take human wives and then have sons and daughters with them. And scripture speaks about that as a bad thing. And that's ultimately where the Nephilim, these giants, come from. And some people have said maybe Paul has something like that in mind as he speaks about the importance of modesty even for the sake of angels. Again, some of these things are are very difficult to parse out, but the important main point is that modesty in worship matters. And modesty in worship is not something new to the New Testament either. In Exodus chapter 28, the priests are instructed uh, to make themselves undergarments. They go from the waist to their thigh and to wear them whenever they enter the tent of meeting. Not just the Holy of Holies, that inner sanctum, but any time they went into this tent where they were going to meet with God or do priestly duties, they were called to be modest. And so Paul might have that in mind as well. The most important point of this passage is that we are to be modest in worship. And we might find ourselves in different settings where that means different things. Uh, like walking down the aisle to give your offering and then walking back in an orderly fashion. 
maybe not wearing a ball cap. Maybe in other cultures it means dressing up a little bit more or not dressing up too much so that you don't make everybody look at your nice clothes. This can mean different things in different cultures, but the moral value of modesty in worship remains the same. We're not going to start getting legalistic about who's being modest and immodest. We're not going to start having a dress code check at the door or anything like that. Uh, But this is something that that maybe you might examine your heart on. When When you get dressed for Sunday morning, when you get ready for worship, you might ask, am I being modest? Is my is my attire, is the way I'm presenting myself going to be a distraction to others? Uh, Because Paul points us to the importance of modesty in worship, and it's because worship matters. Paul wants us to see how important worship truly is. And he'll go on for several more chapters to talk about other things that distract in worship and how to deal with each of those circumstances. So this is the beginning of a longer section, which which points us to the importance of worship. You know, oftentimes in our day, uh, worship can be thought of in sort of a, an anemic way, if we're honest. Uh, I get up on a Sunday morning, I, I put a particular set of clothes on, I go to this place, I sit, I sing some songs, I listen to the Bible, and then I leave. And that can be maybe not explicitly. We don't say that out loud. We don't tell people, yeah, I'm going to sit over there, 110 South Avenue D. I'm going to sing some songs, and I'm going to go to lunch. We don't talk about it like that, but we might sort of have that thought in our minds sometimes. And Paul wants the Corinthians to recognize that something profound is happening in worship. They are encountering the living God. Jesus came to this earth, he walked, he taught, he died for them, and then he rose again, and he lives today. And we get to worship that God. We get to sing praises to him. We get to study his words and read scripture in light of what he has done. And that is what worship is. You know, perhaps the, the greatest picture of worship that we have in all of Scripture that comes from Revelation chapter 5. Let me read that chapter for you. It's relatively brief. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. Encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. And that is the picture of worship that we are given in Scripture. And even in that, there are a lot of images that are hard to understand, that seem difficult to take in. 
because our minds are limited in the understanding that we have. But it points us to the power of worship and the power of the one that we worship. And Paul is urging the Corinthians to take their opportunity to worship seriously. I pray that we might take worship seriously. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks that you sent your son, that he is worthy to open the scroll. And God, we pray that that we would recognize the opportunity that we have to worship. The opportunity that we have to worship you, uh, to worship your son through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And God, I pray that we wouldn't just come and sit and listen, but God, that we would respond to your presence at work. We thank you for this place that we can worship and pray that we might not take for granted the facilities that we have because, God, we know that those people in the video that we saw at the beginning of the service, that they can worship equally as well as we can. And at times they worship in more spirit and truth than we do. I pray, God, when that's the case, that you would convict our hearts, that you would compel us to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.